Hi friends, hope you all enjoyed uh, the part one of uh, Pap smear. Let us continue with part two. Now uh, part two deals mainly with uh, the Bethista system that should be followed by all of you while reporting the Pap smear. If there is any questions you have in your mind, please raise it in the comment and I will try to answer. See you. Bye bye. Now we are moving to abnormal and you have to know all these terminologies known as the Bethista system. The Bethista system came into picture in 88, upgraded 91 and 2001 and it is uh, the current one we are forming is uh, updated in 2014. Why they introduced uh, the Bethista system? Before 88, each lab is uh, using their own terminologies. There is no uniformity in the pap smear reporting. That's why people want to bring uniformity. Uh, and uh, thanks to the Bethista system, now we have uh, recommendations from uh, uh, cytological uh, experts in interpretation of uh, all cytology. For example, Bethista system for thyroid, Milan system for salivary gland. They sat together in a place called Bethista in Maryland, in USA. That's why it is called Bethista system. And uh, specimen type is very, very important. The first thing you have to know, it can be either a conventional or a liquid based or any other methods that are used. I know it is very complicated, but let us see one by one. So it's Bethista system 2014. There are mainly six components in the report. Okay, one is specimen adequacy. Second is general categorization. It is optional. Most of us, uh, we don't use the general categorization because it is more or less uh, overlapping with the third one, interpretation of results. The interpretation of results is only two main parts, negative for intraepithelial lesion or epithelial abnormality present. You have to remember the main aim of the pap smear is to identify high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. That is the main objective of pap smear. What are all the things we are doing in addition to that? They are all the value added uh, items in the pap smear. So epithelial abnormality present and no epithelial abnormality or negative for uh, intraepithelial lesions. That's the interpretation. And interpretation should be followed by ancillary testing if uh, it has been done for a particular patient. And then computer assisted interpretation. Now you know, uh, even though <coughs> in India we do mainly manually, in Western countries, there are too many pap smear because in India, we are not screening everybody. If we start screening everybody, we will run out of pathologists. Uh, so that's why they have a artificial intelligence uh, assisted interpretation. And if you are using uh, any computer assisted interpretation, you have to mention it. We will see it in detail uh, down the lane. And then lastly, educational notes and suggestions. Again, it is optional. So these are all the six uh, portions of the report uh, to be followed by the Bethista system. Let us see one by one. For specimen adequacy, the uh, two things you have to use is whether it is satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Previously, we used to have suboptimal. Now they removed it. General categorization, again, there are three things. Negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, epithelial abnormality present, and others. Coming to the interpretation, number one, negative for intraepithelial lesions or malignancy, and if there are any organisms, it's better to mention them. And common organisms seen in the pap smear are the uh, trichomonas vaginalis, candida, bacterial vaginosis, actinomycosis, uh, herpes simplex virus and uh, chlamydia, sorry, CMV. Uh, chlamydia, you cannot see it on the cytology. Uh, we can identify in ancillary testing. Again, we will talk about it later. So these are all the six uh, organisms you have to see. In addition to that, I will be showing a picture of microfilaria in the pap smear. It's very common in India. They come from the male partner through the uh, seminal uh, fluid. Uh, you may see that in the exams, microfilaria in the pap smear. Other non-neoplastic findings, they are again optional. That includes reactive cellular changes or changes due to inflammation, repair, 
follicular cervicitis, is a radiation and intrauterine device. We will be seeing the pictures of all of them. Then glandular cells, status post hysterectomy. After hysterectomy, you should not see any glandular cells, but in some conditions, you see the glandular cells. So let us see what are they. And then atrophy, characteristic changes, either hyper or parakeratosis, famous metaplasia, tubal metaplasia, and pregnancy related changes. All these comes under other non neoplastic findings where there is no epithelial abnormality. In the third one, which is uh, in the negative for intraepithelial lesion, is the endometrial cells. Previously, it was in abnormal finding, but now they brought it in the negative for intraepithelial lesion. And uh, when you see them, in more than 45 years, it is significant. You may just mention it. When you see them in less than 45 years, uh, it's again optional to mention that. And when you see them in more than 45 years, try to rule out endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial carcinoma. Coming to the most important thing for the pap smear is the epithelial abnormality. When you see epithelial cell abnormality, you have to divide them, whether they are from the squamous cells, or glandular cells or other types of cells. The terminologies that are used in epithelial squamous cell abnormality are atypical squamous cells, LSIL or low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, HSIL or high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and the squamous cell carcinoma. The coelocytes and the SIN1 will be part of LSIL. This is the histological counterpart. In histology, if you see only HPV, it won't come under SIN1. It's only HPV related changes. Whereas in cytology, the minute you see HPV, it will come under LSIF. And SIN2 and SIN3 in histopathology is represented by HSIL. And the last one is the end of the spectrum, which is squamous cell carcinoma. In the glandular cells, the last one is adenocarcinoma. You all know. The one before is the endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ or AIS. The first one is atypical glandular cells, probably favoring reactive. And second one is atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic. Here I am showing you all the six compartments of the, uh, the Bethista system. And I will be highlighting whatever we are talking in each slide. First, let us start with the specimen adequacy. When do you call satisfactory? well preserved and visualized cells that are around 5000 in number in liquid based uh, cytology and 8000 to 12000 i usually remember 10000 5000 in liquid based cytology and 10000 in conventional cytology see whether you see any endocervical cells or squamous metaplastic cells 10 or more of them when you don't see them you just mention or make a note that endocervical or transformation zone cells are not seen and uh, let the clinician decide and take a call. Previously, as I told you before, it is uh, put under uh, limited or suboptimal specimen. Now we are not using the term suboptimal, we are using only satisfactory and unsatisfactory. When you are seeing any obscuring elements, up to 75% it is allowed in satisfactory because you know there is a lot of mucus, a lot of blood in cervix. So up to 75% is allowed in satisfactory smear. When do you call unsatisfactory? When the specimen is rejected. For example, when there is lack of or mismatched patient information between the sample and the request form. Or when the slide is broken beyond repair. These two totally unsatisfactory. Here, we don't even have to stain the slide. We can reject the slide uh, when we are receiving it. When the specimen is processed, and when you see insufficient squamous cells, as I told you, less than 5,000 or less than 8,000 in the conventional, you have to call it unsatisfactory. And when the obscuring element is more than 75% of the epithelial cells, you have to call it unsatisfactory. And please remember, even if you see two cells that are showing HSIL or LSIL feature, this unsatisfactory terminology you cannot use because you are already seeing the lesion. Whenever you see the lesion, you cannot call it unsatisfactory. So these are all the pictures. For example, this uh, you can see the individual cells. This is more like a liquid-based cytology. 
So 5,000 cells are there, so satisfactory. Here also you see good number of uh, squamous cells, satisfactory. Here the squamous cells are very less in number. You see two clusters of endocerical cells, but squamous cells are very less in number. That's why it is unsatisfactory. Here too many inflammatory cells, more than 75%. And here, too much of hemorrhage, more than 75%. That's why these two are unsatisfactory. Then coming to general category, I know it's optional. We are not using an overlap because it is overlapping with the third component. So negative epithelial cell abnormality and others. So coming to the third interpretation, negative for intraepithelial lesion, let us start with the organisms. So these are all the intermediate cells. And these are the nice organisms, pear shaped or kite shaped organisms. See here how nicely they are kite shaped. And some of them are showing greenish red granules. And one more additional finding some Chinese letter patterned organisms are also there along with this uh, pear shaped organisms. So these are Trichomonas vaginalis. And Trichomonas vaginalis usually they live with Leptotherix. Okay, so whenever you see Leptotherix, Look for trichomonas vaginalis. And again, I want to stress one point here. And uh, whenever you see a lot of neutrophils, that doesn't mean it is inflammation. You have to see epithelial changes. See these cells uh, where there is a perinuclear halo. What happens? These organisms they eat up the glycogen around the nuclei. So you have to see the perinuclear halo and uh, pseudo orangophilia. Okay, I will be, uh, I don't have any nice example here. The squamous cells, the intermediate or uh, basal, parabasal cells will have pseudo orangophilia. Here you can see the, if you are non vegetarian, it is a chicken kebab. If you are vegetarian, it is a vegetable kebab, paneer kebab, uh, where you can see the organisms. Here you can see nice budding yeast. And these yeasts are forming pseudo hyphae. These are not true hyphae. And when you see yeast and pseudo hyphae forms, it is characteristic of candidiasis. And you can see some vacuolations around them. Okay. Sometimes the neutrophil, naked nuclei of the neutrophils may be a differential diagnosis of the uh, candida organisms. Here you can see the fuzzy organisms sticking to the Cytoplasm, these are known as clue cells. Okay, this is an example of bacterial vaginosis. Here, you, uh, you can see cotton candy appearance, more uh, balls of uh, organisms. And when you see the organism, they are flamantous. Okay, they show increased number of neutrophils there. And when you see flamantous organisms, sometimes they may take a pink color, sometimes they may take a green color, and they are nothing but actinomycosis and always ask for the history of uh, intrauterine devices because this is more commonly seen in intrauterine devices. So this is a characteristic epithelial abnormality where you can see multinucleation, molding and margination of the chromatin. See how the chromatin is marginated to the nuclear membrane. So that's why we call it as 3M, multinucleation, margination and molding. This is very characteristic of I'm just giving a gap so that you can tell the answer by yourself. It's the example of HSV. Again, we are here in this organism, so that you have to remember. And this is a owl eye appearance, prominent intranuclear inclusions, which are characteristic of CMV. Always ask for the history of immunosuppression or organ transplants. And this is what I was mentioning before. Uh, microfilaria in the pap smear okay in urine and uh, pap smear in cytology and uh, in the lymph nodes in histopathology you can see microfilaria in any indian exam okay in addition to the peripheral smears so keep that in mind this is microfilaria now we are done with organisms we are going to other non-neoplastic findings here you can see the cells with the prominent nucleoli the nuclear cells are nuclei are enlarged but the nuclear membrane is very even and it is, uh, I agree, it's a coarse chromatin, but uniformly distributed. The nuclei are predominantly in the central and sometimes they may be pushed to the periphery, but they are round, they are not sticking to the nuclear membrane. So these are all, as I told you, regenerative cells. Whenever you see nucleoli, you have to think of regeneration and 
a malignancy another concept you have to remember dysplastic cells won't won't they don't show nucleoli either hsl or S, uh, lsl nucleoli are not seen nucleoli are seen only in malignancy except in pathology always there is a except rule when the hsl is involving the endocervical glands they will show nucleoli so this is a regeneration and repair and another very important thing you see how the polarity is maintained even though the nucleoli are there the chromatin is over the course they are all running in one directions okay that maintenance of polarity is very very important in repair and regeneration here the cells are enlarged in size they are reddish as well as greenish and they show cytoplasmic vacuolations and even here you can see one nuclear vacuolation see here the nuclei is enlarged but the cytoplasm is also enlarged so these are all the three features you have to remember uh, maintenance of the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio even though the nuclei are enlarged two tone appearance where you see the two color in the particular cell multinucleation and degenerative changes like vacuolations in the cytoplasm and in the nuclei they are the features of radiation so the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is very very important this uh, if you see the individually this nuclei are malignant but look at this uh, whole cell how big it is so that nuclear cytoplasmic ratio maintenance is very very important in cases of radiation induced atp small cells some of them show cytoplasmic vacuolation here you see they are looking more like uh, uh, signet cells isn't that so here you can mistake it for hsl or adenocarcinoma but ask for history they are very few in number number 1 okay and when you ask for history they will have the history of iud these are all the litigation cells iud associated cells so when you see few in number you call them as a, as asc us we will be seeing it in a minute or asc h whenever there is a history you ask them to remove the iud if they are worried and then uh, repeat this smear after 3 to 6 months to see is there any abnormality so now we are coming to the glandular cells post hysterectomy there are nine situations again this is a university questions glandular cell in post hysterectomy setup number one reason is wrong history or wrong patient which is very common in uh, many hospitals second one they might have done partial hysterectomy even though they mention only hysterectomy when you go back to the case sheet you can find out they left the cervix they removed only the Uh, low return segment and the upper uterus partial hysterectomy third is glandular cells coming from bartholin or other paravaginal glands fourth is sometimes the atrophic cells can look like uh, uh, glandular cells therapy induced metaplasia of the squamous cells for example they might have removed uh, for uh, cso weeks or co endometrium the patient might have undergone uh, chemotherapy or radiation it may induce uh, metaplasia of squamous cells uh, where it may look like glandular cells the the next one is the fallopian tube prolapse sometimes in the vaginal walls the when they did uh, only hysterectomy simple hysterectomy without removing tubes and ovaries the fallopian tubes may prolapse and come and they may shed the glandular cells that is also very very important to rule out in uh, post hysterectomy setup the another very important thing is vaginal adenosis or endometriosis that you have to keep it in mind even after hysterectomy you may see glandular cell in these conditions recto vaginal or vesico vaginal fistula can also produce glandular cells coming in the pap smear and lastly recurrent adenocarcinoma so these are all the nine conditions where you see glandular cells in post hysterectomy setup here you see nice pap smear these are all uh, metaplastic cells which are pink in color and these are all parabasal cells the parabasal cells are predominant so here the parabasal cells are predominant but in addition to that they have pseudo orangeophilia and some perinuclear halo along with inflammatory cells so the, basically it is atrophy here it is atrophic vaginitis and here it is only atrophy without inflammation 
uh, here if you are very lucky you can see this much of uh, nice uh, cilia okay and uh, you can see the tall elongated cells here uh, very easy to diagnose a tubal metaplasia here but imagine if you see only this cluster without this peripheral cilia you may mistake it for ais or adenocarcinoma so whenever you are having some clusters of cells glandular cells with the atp look at the periphery for the cilia and when you see cilia it is benign it is tubal metaplasia Tubal metaplasia is very easy to diagnose in histopathology, but it's very difficult in cytology, especially when you don't see the cilia or the terminal bodies. Uh, these are keratotic lesions, which are very common in India because uh, many of our patients uh, have prolapse. And whenever there is prolapse, they may produce hyperkeratosis. When you see squamous cells without nuclei, it is hyperkeratosis. When you see mature squamous cells with the nuclei, it is parakeratosis. Whenever you see parakeratosis along with the hyperkeratosis, it may be prolapse. But whenever you see only parakeratosis, it can be a keratotic uh, intraepithelial lesion. You have to pay more attention. Okay, parakeratosis needs more investigation. Chlamydia, as I told you, you don't see the organisms, but it produces follicular cervicitis, which is uh, very easy to diagnose in histopathology. Whereas imagine the follicular center cells coming in uh, pap smear, they will look like this, okay? They will look like a high grade HSIL cells or they may look like uh, adenocarcinoma in situ cells. The clue here is they will have a lot of tingible body macrophages admixed with them. When you see tingible body macrophages with the atypical cells, uh, try to look for the history of uh, chlamydia or send additional uh, fluid from the liquid based cytology uh, material for chlamydia. So it is follicular cervicitis. And the, uh, again, here we are talking about uh, third compartment, uh, negative for intraepithelial lesions, and uh, it is more like uh, endometrial cells. Okay, this is the endometrial cells. And the cells you see in the periphery are the epithelial cells, whereas the central ball is the stromal cell. So this is like a ball of cells uh, with uh, epithelial and stromal cells. And uh, this is also known as exodus. And this is predominantly seen in menstrual endometrium. And you can see sometimes uh, even non-menstrual period in people less than 45 years of age. But when you see them in more than 45 years of age, you have to think of hyperplasia or carcinoma. Seeing endometrial cells, after 45 years of age, we have to investigate. Uh, epithelial abnormality, squamous epithelial abnormality, it is again atypical squamous cells, low grade uh, intraepithelial lesion, high grade intraepithelial lesion, and squamous cell carcinoma. Whenever you see atypical squamous cells, you really you don't know what is the significance of it, where we call it atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or you cannot exclude HSIL. You are thinking of HSIL of the changes in atypical squamous cells, then it will become ASCH. And you have to remember the number of diagnoses you are giving per year has to be uh, kept in uh, watch. And if it is more than two to 5%, you have to revisit your criteria. And this table is very essential to know how to differentiate ASC, US, ASCH, LSIL, HSIL, and squamous cell carcinoma. The number one point is nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. In ASC, US, it is less than one third of the cell. In ASCH and high grade HSIL, it is more than two third of the cell. The nuclear size is more than two third of the cell. When the nuclei is enlarged, and it is one third to two third, then it is LSIL. In squamous cell carcinoma, the NC ratio is not very useful. You all know it can have abundant cytoplasm or it can have less cytoplasm. So it varies, nuclear cytoplasmic ratio varies in squamous cell carcinoma. The abnormal cells will be increased in number in LSIL, HSIL and squamous cell carcinoma. And when you see classic coelocytes, it is more like LSIL. When the nuclear membrane is irregular, it is more towards dysplastic or neoplastic malignant. 
when the chromatin is coarse it is more hsil or squamous cell carcinoma when the nucleoli is present as i told you it is either carcinoma or a regenerative reactive where you are thinking of high grade hsil tadpole cells and tumor diathesis very characteristic of squamous cell carcinoma and hpv typing when you see the high risk hpv it is more of hsil and squamous cell carcinoma let us see the pictures this is the normal pap uh, components of a pap smear uh, squamous uh, superficial squamous cells intermediate squamous cells basal parabasal and metaplastic squamous cells here there are only very few cells nuclei is slightly enlarged showing pseudocoelocytes uh, this is the you compare it with the nuclei of the neutrophil they are slightly enlarged so you don't know the significance so you call that as uh, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance here they are more like metaplastic cells but some of them are showing molding and some of them are showing variation in nuclear size but uh, they are only very few in number so here you don't know the uh, significance of them but you want to rule out uh, high grade uh, hsil so it is a uh, example of asch here the nuclei are enlarged in more than one third of the cell and it is having characteristic coelocytes and uh, see in each cell the nuclei is not occupying more than two third of the cell so this is lsil here you see the clusters of cells where the nuclei are occupying almost the full of the cell or more than two third of the cell and the nuclear membrane is irregular so this is hsil and the last spectrum in the category tadpole cells very irregular nuclei so this is carcinoma so normal ascus asch lsil hsil and the squamous cell carcinoma we will see them in bigger pictures so this is classic of some nuclear enlargement you are not sure very few in number if you see lot of these you can call it lsil but even you see one or two cells you have to call them as asc us here the cells are having very irregular nuclear membrane okay and uh, see here it looks like a brain cerebri form nuclei these are features of hsil but only very few nuclei are showing that okay so less than 10 cells 10 cell is the criteria you have to follow if it is less than 10 cell you have to think of ASCH atypical squamous cells you want to rule out HSIL here you see definite enlargement okay and uh, perinuclear uh, coelocytes vacuolations with coelocytes okay so these are classic examples of LSIL and these are the typical coelocytes typical coelocytes whereas here it is uh, pseudo coelocyte these are glycogen rich uh, normal cells the glycogen is pushing the nuclei to the periphery and producing a vacuolations these are known as pseudo coelocytes whereas here the nuclei are more in the center they are more racinoid with the irregular or uh, wrinkled nuclear membrane and uh, unevenly distributed chromatin so these are all example of coelocytes and the lsir so this is uh, you can close your eyes and you can diagnose hsil because the nuclei are occupying more than two third of the uh, site of the cell and they are very coarse nuclear membrane irregularity unevenly distributed chromatin remember the four quadrant rule this uh, half is having more chromatin when compared to this half so this is hsil and this is tumor diathesis here tadpole cells nucleoli see the nucleoli as i told you nucleoli means reactive or malignancy not dysplastic okay very hyperchromatic nuclei these are diagnostic of squamous cell carcinoma but in our institute we never call squamous cell carcinoma 100% for sure in pap smear we always call favor squamous cell carcinoma and biopsy we don't want to go for verdim cystectomy with uh, squamous cell carcinoma in the pap smear especially when there is uh, only a small lesion clinically clinically suspicious and pathologically more uh, in favor of squamous cell carcinoma 
we want a biopsy to confirm before going for radical hysterectomy. So those are all the squamous epithelial lesions. Coming to atypical glandular cells, it is AGC, favor neoplasty, AIS or adenocarcinoma. Even though there are four compartments, it's very easy to diagnose AIS and adenocarcinoma and very difficult for these two. Okay, no strict criteria are available. And some tables are very good for exam purpose. And uh, see the difference, normal and AIS adenocarcinoma, very easy. But AGC, very few cells, distinct cell border, no feathering, it's very difficult to diagnose. So try to push yourself to either normal or AIS that has a characteristic uh, <clears throat> criteria. So, uh, diagnostically by picture, this is more normal endocervical cells. This is atypical glandular cells. And uh, this is AIS and this is adenocarcinoma. We will see it in, uh, in a minute. So, these are the endocervical cells that are looking atypical. Remember, endocervical cells should have a more like a cluster of grape appearance without any overlap. Here, they started overlapping, but I don't see any mitosis. There is no feathering. Feathering means the nuclei will try to come out of the cluster. I will show it to you in a minute. Okay. Here they are all nicely arranged in clusters. So the AIS is not uh, met. That's why I call it as atypical glandular cells. This is endocervical and this is endometrial. <clears throat> and many times it's difficult to differentiate endocervical from endometrial cells in uh, atypical glandular cells. Favor neoplastic, no specific criteria. Any criteria, any book you may refer, they will say in between the AGC and the AIS. This is the characteristic feature of AIS. Even though I don't have the label, I'm 100% sure this is AIS. See the feathering. Okay, It's like a feather in the crown where they try to escape from the cluster. They're trying to escape from the cluster. They are stratified they are very atypical okay this feathering is very crowding and feathering and the stratification very characteristic of ais endocervical and this is adenocarcinoma because of the irregular arrangement and the nucleoli okay see the prominent nucleoli adenocarcinoma endocervical adenocarcinoma again very coarse chromatin again you have to correlate clinically thick and endometrium postmenopausal bleeding very important for endometrium. And for completion, I am showing the other tumors where we can see small cell carcinoma that may be one type of endocervical adenocarcinoma. You can see sometimes epithelial cells and the stromal cells slightly spindled out showing malignant features. You have to think of carcinosarcoma. Prominent nucleoli, some brownish pigment, you have to think of melanoma. Very undifferentiated cells, looks like air, yes or uh, sorry, HSIL, you have to think of lymphoma also. And here it is more characteristic. If you see pap smear columnar cells like this with the stratification and with the very irregular, you have to think of metastatics from the colo colonic carcinoma where rectovaginal fistula might have formed and uh, the carcinomatous cells may come into the pap smear. You have to keep these tumors in mind even though they are not that common. Sometimes HSIL and AIS difficult to differentiate but this feathering favors more of AIS. Okay, Strips of columnar cells, feathering, gland formation, absence of coelocytes and clear background. This is HSIL. See the inflammatory background whereas in AIS it will be more like clear background. Endocervical and endometrial, the feathering is present in the endocervical whereas endometrial lesion no feathering. And uh, elderly age, clinical history is very important. Whereas endocervical adenocarcinomas are more common in younger age group people. There is no other very specific thing. And HPV may help you. HPV is present in endocervical lesions, whereas in endometrial lesions, they will be absent. Clinical history, clinical history, and clinical history. So coming to the ancillary testing, it can be molecular testing for HPV, chlamydia, and gonorrhea, and for P16. So whenever you do test, indicate the test method. Results should be interpreted and understandable for the clinician. And the results should be correlated with cytological features. Whenever you use instruments, you tell the what is the type of instrument. This is an instrument from a company called Thinprap. 
uh, so you have to mention what is the type of instrument used and what is the name of the technologies verifying the automated data because whenever there is something wrong we have to identify which person handled that test educational notes is the last component of the result here it has to be concise and consistent with the guidelines uh, by professional organisms it should be rendered in cases of unsatisfactory specimen further triage and management morphological features are ambiguous you have to use the uh, educational notes and in complex cases coming to the quality control it is mainly to reduce the errors what are all the errors that can happen errors can happen in varying stages preparation the error may be dosing or during menses the remedy is patient education sampling lack of, lack of endocervical cells or too much of inflammation and blood clinical education and uh, the sample people who are taking the samples can be educated and liquid based preparation is used to reduce the inflammation and blood like that for each uh, task the errors may be there and these are all the remedies so I just keep it for a minute so that you can read by yourself and whenever there is a error you please do root cause analysis and take corrective and preventive action when to take the pap smear this is very very important uh, when it is less than 21 and more than 65 no need for pap test when the patient's age is 21 to 29 pap smear every three years from 30 to 65 years pap smear if you do without hpv testing you have to do it every three years as uh, in 21 to 29 but when you do along with HPV assay, you have to repeat it every five years. The exceptions are whenever there is abnormal results, when patient has taken HPV vaccine in post hysterectomy, please use the individualized schedule. So please remember this age criteria. And what is the algorithm used for primary HPV screening? Whenever the type 16 and 18 is positive, these are high risk HPV, immediately refer for colposcopy. Whenever you find other 12 types of uh, high risk HPV, uh, see the cytology. When the cytology is uh, no intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, follow it up in 12 months. When it is more than ASC, whether it is uh, atypical squamous cells of undetermined malignant significance or LSIL or HSIL, refer for colposcopy. <clears throat> when the primary HPV screening is negative, you have to go for protein screening. And I have 12 cases and these are all the diagnoses. Tokyo message, pap smear is the most successful screening method. Strict criteria to be followed for each category of diagnosis. The Bethista system should be followed for consistency in reporting. Clinical correlation and follow-up is very essential good quality control i don't have to say the importance of it and updating the knowledge the references are please visit this website bethistar.soc.wic.edu they have the whole criteria the latest criteria and a lot of pictures and they use edmund sibas and barbara's book on cytology thank you very much and have a great day